Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out. We had a great turnout for Cars and Coffee this morning. I hope you got to come and see some of those beautiful cars out in the parking lot. But anyway, thank you for joining us this morning for our Tread Talk. You know, last month, the Midwest Dream Car Collection hosted a First Responders Day with staff from the Manhattan Fire Department, Raleigh County EMS, and the Raleigh County Police Department present. They brought some amazing vehicles that museum guests were allowed to explore up and close, while first responders were available to answer their questions. If you attended last month's Tread Talk, you're aware that we had a couple of firefighters from the Manhattan Fire Department discuss the history of the Manhattan Fire Department and the changes in firefighting equipment over the past 125 years. Today, we are honored to have as our speaker, Corporal Joseph Ehrlich from the Raleigh County Police Department. Officer Ehrlich is going to speak to us this morning about accident reduction, exactly what that means and how we can do our part to help. So let's please give him a warm welcome. Thanks for coming out this morning. I'm sure uh, at 11 o'clock on a Saturday, uh, there were better things on TV than me, but uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, I'm not a car guy, and I, I don't listen to me pull away in the parking lot. My brakes need changed. It's not good. I, I am not a technically precise guy when it comes to, uh, to engines and things like that. So I was having a hard time thinking of what exactly I would talk to you about for a, uh, a tread talk. And I've been a cop for 16 years and some change. And I thought, well, the one thing I've done a lot with a car is pull them over. Um, and so like, I could talk about that a little bit. Uh, and, and maybe some of the reasoning why we do what we do when it comes to traffic stops and some of our uh, philosophies and our programs that are built around traffic enforcement and why we do what we do. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit today about an accident reduction program we have. We call it ARC, uh, Accident Reduction Citations, but uh, it's not all about writing tickets. So uh, I want to talk about that a little bit here and let you know kind of what we're doing and what that looks like and why we're doing what we're doing. All right, so what is it? Uh, every, it's no secret that hey, I work for the government. Uh, we have limited funding. It's mostly tied up in uh, personnel costs, and there's only so many police officers and so many places to be. So several years back, we started looking at how we could increase our enforcement, increase our presence without having to ask for even more money to get more cops out there on the street. Uh, and one of that is we've started relying really heavily on data. What do the numbers tell us about where we need to be and what we need to do with our time? Uh, so what that does is we, we can crunch the numbers on, say, collisions and say, where are crashes happening? When are they happening? And what's causing them? And then we can focus our enforcement time on those things in those places at those times. Uh, along the way, if we're doing this and we're organizing and, and, and being deliberate about it, we can also work on how we present that information to people we pull over and explain to them why we're doing what we're doing. So it maybe isn't just so uh, mystical as to why I pulled you over for not using a turn signal or something like that at midnight, uh, that you might have a better frame of reference for why we're doing what we're doing and maybe think it's a little more legitimate that we're doing what we're doing, if that makes sense. Uh, so the goal of this is by focusing our efforts in, in the right places at the right times, doing the right things, we can hopefully reduce collisions, reduce injuries and fatalities, and, uh, and make the place a little safer without uh, having to throw a lot more cops at the problem. So that's why we're doing what we're doing with this ARC program. It's, uh, it's numbers based. So the way we came about this information was, uh, was pretty deliberate. We didn't want to just make it up or say what we think it is or anything like that. And we also didn't want to come at everybody with just a bunch of numbers and say, here's what we need to do for you because the numbers say so. We wanted to have something a little broader than that. So K-State teamed up with some of our command staff members several years back and they did a study uh, that looked at uh, not just what the numbers say about crashes, but what the community says about them. Uh, there's a lot of information that went into there. Some of it was about the way they perceive the police and how we interact with them on traffic stops. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of back and forth with community members to make this study. But uh, one of the interesting findings out of what they put together was uh, when people were asked, members of the public were asked, what do they think the police should focus on when they're making traffic stops? What kind of things do you think cause crashes? They came up with a list of things. Uh, the top five are right up here. Incidentally, those go straight hand in hand with what we say cause crashes and what our data says cause crashes. So this is kind of a rare instance where uh, the people in the government are all on the same page with something. Yeah, you won't see that very often, right? Yeah, but here it is. So this is what we focus on. We call these our big five. These are the five things we really want to push and enforce 
uh, and make stops for? Because these are the five things that you folks say you think we should stop people for and enforce. And these are the five things that the data says cause crashes. So if we want to reduce them, we need to do something about them. Inattentive driving, the first one. Uh, there's the book definition and then there's the broad definition that all of us would think of. And so inattentive driving can, can actually uh, be a lot of things to a reasonable person. In the book, it's real specific. Uh, but inattentive driving, what's the biggest thing you guys can think of uh, when you think of inattentive driving causing crashes in this community? Cell phones, yeah, right there it is. Yeah, that's a separate rule, but that's what we're all thinking of is, is inattentive driving. So that's, that's things like that. You're not paying attention, your head's in the cloud, you're doing something else. We have so many distractions in our cars now uh, that that drives a lot of crashes. And the one thing most people won't tell you when they're involved in a crash and you say what happens is, I was on my cell phone texting when I hit the car in front of me. That's not what they say, uh, but more on that. The other one, failure to yield and failure to stop. Uh, that's a pretty obvious one, right? Uh, when we, we roll the stop sign or we miss the stoplight, we weren't thinking, we weren't, we weren't looking. That one drives a huge amount of our crashes. And I think we can all agree that you should stop at stop signs and red lights, that's, that's reasonable. Uh, following too close or tailgating, that's another big one. And that's where the, I wasn't on my cell phone, I just ran into the car in front of me. That's where we'll catch that one a lot. And that's a lot of times what we end up stuck with is uh, most of us don't just plant the car into the one in front of us unless we were you know, not paying attention. And uh, the common thing that we're not paying attention to for the younger people at least is, uh, is the cell phone. But following too close is a big one. And uh, that one's kind of hard to enforce sometimes too, right? Because it's somewhat, uh, somewhat subjective. Uh, we actually have some radar guns now that they're laser based and they do some really great stuff with, with, uh, with LIDAR lasers and, and they can give you really good speed. But we also have some that can photograph and track how much uh, following distance you've left the car in front of you. So when you hit the button, it can snapshot how close the car was following so that when you go to court, you can show it to the judge and everyone else. There was this much following distance and here's a picture of it. So that's helped us out a lot with being able to uh, enforce following too close. Driving under the influence, that one's pretty obvious. Uh, it turns out this is a college town and a military town. Uh, we got a bunch of 20-somethings, and 20-somethings like to drink beer, and uh, uh, unfortunately, that means a lot of people get behind the wheel of the car and drive, and, and there's some pretty uh, spectacular uh, collisions that result. Uh, that one drives a lot of our crashes, a lot of our dumb crashes at night, drives a lot of that. And this, when I talked earlier about why we stop what we stop, and that these are the big five violations, it's really hard to go pull somebody over for DUI, you know what I mean? Unless they're driving down the sidewalk, uh, you know, it's hard to pull them over for DUI. But on a Friday or a Saturday night as a patrol officer on midnights, when I'm driving around and I see a headlight out on a car at midnight, that is my chance to pull somebody over for DUI. Either they're not drunk and we give them a warning, hey, your headlight's out, go fix it. Or they are drunk and now we can have a conversation. Uh, so when we talk about these arc stops and, and specific violations to get specific things, when it comes to DUI, if you get pulled over in the evening uh, or at night or in certain areas of town, that might be the reason you're being stopped for something relatively minor is we just want to have a conversation and see if, if we're, we're good to be driving tonight because we want to drive that number down. We want to reduce the DUIs. I really don't care if your brake light is out. I want you to fix it. It's a, it's a violation of the rules, but it's not what I'm going to write you a ticket for. But I do care if you've had too much to drink, right? So that's why a lot of us are making stops like that that may seem petty. It's that I wanna see if there's something else going on there uh, because we wanna drive that number down because DUI injures and kills drivers in this city with some regularity. We wanna, we wanna knock that number down. And then speeding's the obvious one, right? And we're not talking going two or three over the speed limit. That's, there's, no one's gonna stop you for that. We're talking like the 10 over and, and higher speeds. Uh, that we're, we're starting to get concerned about because speed there is a direct correlation between how fast we're driving and how bad the crash is and so a bad you know how bad injuries can be and things like that so these are the five things that we think uh, are worthy of uh, our time and that the community says are worthy of our time so that's why we're pushing these so how does it actually work for us uh, as I've said before we have smart people who sit in an office with a computer I'm not one of those uh, it took me about 15 minutes and two or three people's help to get this working. Uh, but uh, we do have a criminal intelligence unit. And these folks drive, they get all of our data. We keep everything that we do, every number that we generate, everything that happens is documented and stored somewhere. 
Uh, these poor folks, their job is to dig through all the numbers and all the things and make sense out of that uh, with the goal of figuring out where we can send our limited number of cops, when we can send them there and what they should be doing with their time. We do this for more than just traffic. We do this for things like burglaries, if cars are getting broken into. We track all that and we figure out what neighborhoods are getting hit hard and then we set timers where on our call screen that we follow on our car, it says at this time you need to be at this place and just be there because the stats say it's likely to be a high crime time and a high crime place. We do the same thing with car crashes. They crunch the numbers for say the month or a previous couple weeks and they say we've had the most car crashes in this general area and they'll have hot spots around the county and say this is where accidents are likely to occur historically and usually that means there's something design wise maybe there's a road issue there it's a really congested area something like that but for whatever reason accidents are concentrated in this one area they'll then figure out what times they're likely to happen again everything's tracked so if we know that around noon on tuesday this part of town has a lot of car crashes Around noon on Tuesday, the officers on duty have a thing pop up on their computer in the car that says whoever the area officer is, is going to that area right now at noon on Tuesday, and they're gonna hang out there. And they're gonna look for those five things that I just uh, put on the screen and anything else and just be visible with the hope that by having an officer there who's visible, people slow down a little bit, they pay a little better attention in an area that we know we need them to pay better attention. And if they don't pay attention, well then there's an officer there to remind them of why we should follow the rules. Uh, sometimes when you see an officer stop somewhere strange, you know, along the side of the road, uh, just kind of being there somewhere visible, maybe running radar, maybe not. A lot of times it's because they were told whatever you're doing right now, as long as it's not a crime issue that you can't drop, you're going over here and you're hanging out because the numbers say we need to be there right now to slow people down. So that's how that side of it works. We're going to figure out where you need to be send an officer there to, to be present and to, to take some enforcement action. And when they do make a stop under this program, if they're there on one of these ARC, we call them uh, areas, part of the way they do their traffic stop is a little bit different. It, it probably won't sound dramatically different, but generally speaking, they're gonna tell you why they stopped you like always. They're gonna give you a chance to explain why whatever happened happened you know uh, sometimes there's a good reason for why we do uh, do things that, that get the police involved in our lives right uh, and I'd like to hear it I, I'm a guy who likes a good excuse I'll tell you that. Uh, that that can work on me sometimes they're really good sometimes they're really entertaining and either way I'll, I'll like to hear them uh, but yeah we want to hear what your side of the story is why why things are happening the way they are give you a chance to explain to me uh, the additional thing that we've added uh, with this ARC program is we try to explain to you why we just made the stop that we made. Because again, at 10.30 at night, if I'm driving home from work and I get pulled over because I had a brake light out, like I don't know my brake light's out. I know that's not the crime of the century. I don't think anybody really cares. So why are you wasting your time pulling me over? Well, if I explain to you that, hey, you know, this is a high accident area. Uh, we are making stops on certain uh, violations because we're concerned about, you know, reducing collisions. One of the biggest drivers of collisions is DUI, and by making this stop, it gives me a chance to talk to you and make sure that you're sober and good to drive, and since you are, I'll write you a warning and have you on your way. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to educate the public a little bit, not just about the law, but about why we're enforcing it the way that we are, and hopefully get a little bit of credibility from people, uh, and not have them feel like we're just out there picking on you, or uh, you know, it's because I'm whatever, or it's because of this, or it's, it's some other factor. It's, I'm stopping you because we want to reduce accidents. These are the five things that cause them. You did one of them and yeah, no, I just want to have a conversation about this. And also it helps that because these numbers don't just come from us, they come from you, we can point out that it was a survey done, a study done that involved not just the police, but the community. The community agrees that these are things we want to stop people for. So on our ARC citations, we do a lot more explaining ourselves, if that makes sense. And I think that's fair. I mean, we're representatives of you. And uh, I, I do think we have an obligation to explain ourselves uh, to the public when there's a question. And that's a big thing here. It's not just about reducing the crashes or driving up traffic stop numbers or anything like that. It's doing it in a way that is a little more legitimate, I think. Uh, it's an opportunity for people to express their issues with us, but also for us to explain to you why, why things are happening the way they are and why we're using our time uh, to enforce what we're enforcing. Uh, so it's not just about driving down the, uh, the accident numbers, it's about making interactions with the police a little more uh, 
I'm not going to say positive because it's not very often that we have really positive interactions with the police. Nobody calls me, you know, because they're having an awesome day. Uh, usually when we're interacting, it's because something negative is happening. Uh, but we want to make sure that when we do have those interactions, that at least you feel like you were treated fairly. At least you had a chance to explain yourself. At least we were reasonable with you and as much as we could be. And so this kind of permeates a lot of what we do now across the board, but this is how we're trying to incorporate that into our traffic stops, which is something we do with a lot of, a lot of volume, right? It's one of the most common interactions you'll have with the police in your life. Um, and so if that's the limited amount of time you ever talk to the police, then we should probably make sure that we're using that time in a, in a reasonable way. So I kept it fairly brief on this because I figured there'd be questions not just about this, but about you know, traffic law in general. Because like I said, it turns out that's the one place most of us will contact the police is in a car stop. It's the one place that uh, you can't really avoid us. If you drive long enough, inevitably the police are gonna pull you over for something. Again, I don't know my tail lights out. I don't know that uh, my headlights out. I went just a little too fast in a place where I didn't see the speed limit sign. Uh, so I figured people would have a lot of questions about rules and about the why we do things the way we do things. And I wanted to leave plenty of time to talk to you about those things. Uh, the, the ARC program that we talked about here, it, I, I think there's really some validity to it. Uh, you know, there was obviously a, a horrible crash that occurred out here not too long back, right outside of this place. Ironically, right after that crash occurred on the call screen came up, this area, this time, we need an officer over here because statistically, that's a high volume crash area. Far from the only time I've seen that happen. So the point of that being, the data works, it really does. It tells us what we need to know about it. And uh, I, I think that it, it does pay off for us to do these kinds of things. And I wanted to make sure you understood why we do it. And also, if you do see an officer sitting somewhere on the side of the road, it's not just because they're being lazy, although sometimes maybe they are. Uh, but most of the time, it's because they're trying to, to be in the right place at the right time and help reduce these crashes. Um, you know, we can't, we can't reduce or uh, prevent everything, but we want to do our best to try. So questions on ARC or anything else that I can answer for you? All right. Sir. How's the traffic circles figuring in and people in Manhattan getting used to this? Okay, yeah, so question is about traffic circles. Uh, are they helping and uh, are people figuring them out? Um, well, that's relative. Uh, <laughs> so I, I guess I would look at it this way. Uh, I think about uh, like the fourth and Bluemont area the most. Um, I'm sure y'all are familiar with how it used to be and the way it is now. Uh, if you wanted to turn left from 4th Street onto Bluemont at three in the afternoon, uh, about 50 people behind you are going to want to rip you out of the car and, and tell you to turn somewhere else, right? Uh, it really backed up traffic and then people would sit for a really long time and then they'd get impatient and then they would just go. And so that drove a whole lot of crashes. In the early days, we had something called impact zone before we had the ARC system and some other initiatives we had. And impact zone basically said that northeast side of town, all of our crashes, most of our crime, everything's going on there. Just go out there and do every cop thing you can think of in this area. Turns out if you lived in that part of town, that was not very exciting. Uh, you didn't want to be there. You couldn't drive anywhere without the cops bothering you. So we got rid of that. But that fourth and Bluemont area, that was one that constantly driving uh, collisions and traffic violations because people just do stupid stuff to try to get out into the road. So while we do still have collisions in that traffic circle, far less. I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but anecdotally, I can tell you uh, from my years here that, uh, yeah, I, I've noticed an enormous difference, not just between the collision amount, which is significantly less, but I don't know that I would just sit at 4th and Bloom on anymore and wait for traffic violations. It used to be if I wanted to pull over a car, I'll just go sit right there. And I, there's somebody's going to do something incredibly stupid because they're impatient and it's a dangerous intersection. Uh, so roundabouts, traffic circles, they, I think they do work. They're just awkward. Uh, I, I think we're all maybe starting to get used to them, but uh, they do. They slow people down. They allow traffic to keep moving, and then it reduces that uh, impatience level. But I, I, I think they're, they're catching on at least. Uh, some of them are a little weird. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. All right. Sir. I have a question on something that has kind of befuddled me in the past. Uh, there are in city of Manhattan clearly stated lines as right turn only, left turn only, and two cars only on this. 
yet on Fort Riley Boulevard at Anderson and at Kimball, people exit and then they form side by side. One wants to go right, one goes to left, but there's nothing that indicates that two lines are permitted. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle something like that where there's an ambiguity? That's a good question. I, when I was trying to make sure I was understanding what you're saying, I was thinking of the Anderson off ramp over here from Seth Child uh, when you come down there and I thought about that. Yeah, if I'm gonna turn left, I'm getting on the left side of that. If you're gonna turn right, you get on the right side of it, but there's no line. Is that my tracking the? Yeah, and sometimes people behind will get really upset that you're not observing the two line tradition even though we're coming off of a state highway which looks at things a little differently than in the city itself. Yeah, and I guess that's a good way to put it. There's the tradition of it, and then there's the flat out black and white lines on the ground law. And I wanna make clear too that I'm not a lawyer and I'm not gonna be able to give you legal advice, and this is just a guy's opinion, right? So before uh, I say something and then you go before the judge and say, well, Joe told me I could do it. I just wanna make sure you know I am just a cog in the wheel, right? I'm a guy with an opinion. Uh, I'll answer you as best as I understand these things and what I would do from my judgment if I was called there. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I, I fall back on what's the letter of the law and what are the lines on the ground, right? Because uh, I have to diagram every crash that I work. I have to draw a picture of it. Uh, yeah, that's not pretty. Uh, if there's not a clearly defined uh, rule that says you have to be here to turn left, you have to be here to do right, to turn right, and it's just one road that's not delineated by lane markers or anything, when it comes down to it, I'm gonna call that one road. Uh, I may be impatient to be further behind, you could have stopped right in the middle and we could be left and right, but I'll deal with that and that'll be okay. Uh, so yeah, as far as that goes, I, I don't know that there's a flat out rule that says, uh, you know, without lane dividers that thou shalt. Uh, there are rules that say, like, if I'm going to make a turn, I need to be as far to that side of the roadway as, as I can reasonably be. But without a divider, I, I don't know that I would uh, make an issue of that from a legal side. And again, that's just my opinion on that. If it's not divided, it's one lane. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I have one more. This, this entails driver's education back in odd zero when I took it. Uh, when you are turning onto a lane, you should turn into the closest lane rather than skipping a lane to go in. And then once you're in the closest lane, then you signal to go left. Yeah. That is kind of a 50-50 proposition on people obeying that. Your take. Yeah, so the law is clear on that one. Uh, you turn into the nearest available lane. So if I'm making a left turn and there's two lanes, I turn into the leftmost lane that's available. Uh, that's flat out uh, the, the way the book reads. If I'm making a right turn and there's two lanes, I don't get to pull into the one closest to the middle. I have to pull into the rightmost lane. I turn into the nearest available lane. And that is something that I'll stop a lot of cars for. The reason I stop a lot of cars for that is because people don't know that's a rule and it is a rule that causes a lot of crashes. It's like not using your turn signal. Really minor thing, but according to NHTSA at least, drives a lot of collisions because people don't know what you're doing as so they run into you. Uh, so while it's not a big heavy uh, traffic violation, I'll stop for a lot of those smaller things just to remind people that A, it's a rule, or B, you may not know it's a rule, like the turning into the nearest available lane. And the reason that matters, the reason that is a rule, is imagine at a green light where I can make a left turn if it's clear to go, and you can make a right turn from your side and we're facing each other. Uh, if we're both turning in the same direction and we both go to our nearest available lanes, we can both turn. You can make your left turn, I can make my right turn into the two lane road, and we're both safe and everything's fine because we're both going into our nearest available lanes. If I start to pull to the middle lane, uh, the not the nearest available one, but the one closest to the middle when I make my right turn, and you make a left turn pulling into the nearest available lane, we have a problem now, uh, and that's my fault. So that's why that's a rule. It may seem really petty and it may seem really dumb, but there's a reason that it exists and that's why I, I'll stop cars for that and enforce that one. I'm not necessarily gonna write you a ticket for that, but I'll definitely stop you and educate you on that and write you a warning. Uh, because I don't think a lot of people don't realize that's a rule. They think it's maybe a courtesy thing when it's a black and white rule. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Who else had a question? Yes, ma'am. Tell me about the inverted, I think it's called an inverted diamond. That oh, was child yeah. The divergent diamond. Yeah. <laughs> well, it works. I, I don't know. It's like my television. I don't know how it works, 
but it works. Uh, <laughs> I like yeah. it better than the circles. It, yeah, it is good. It's uh, it's a little complicated, and if you're not from around here, you know, and you run into a thing like that, it, it is a little bit complicated. She's talking about at Seth Child and Fort Riley Boulevard there under the overpass uh, for Fort Riley Boulevard. Uh, there's that cross-shaped road area. They call it a divergent diamond, I believe, is the, the technical term. Um, it's, it's strange. Uh, that was another area we had a lot of crashes, a lot of, a lot of weird accidents there because of the way it used to be laid out with having to wait a long time and cars were stopped half in traffic, half out. You had to like kind of pay attention to where the, where the other lane was returning. Uh, what the Divergent Diamond does is basically allows cr uh, traffic to cross over without an overpass. They're able to, to make an X shape, the two roads do. And it's, uh, it's got a lot of weird ons and offs and light controls. Uh, is it a question about like how to navigate them or is it just what do I think of them? Are they effective, reducing accidents? Yes, I, I think so. I, I want to say that one, I don't know how much number difference there is in that particular spot. I would have to look at the numbers on that. Uh, anecdotally, I would say yes, it's good. I, I, I don't know what the numbers say on that intersection, but we would have them. If you would ever want to know about something like that, you can call the Riley County Police Department and ask to talk to our criminal intel people, and they can get you numbers on stuff like this. They keep everything. Um, and those are your numbers, you know. Um, so if you do have those questions, you can ask and, and see what they can help you out with on that if, if you want the hard facts. I, I do think, yeah, it definitely reduces the stress of that spot once you know how to navigate it. I imagine if I was coming from somewhere else and had never seen that before, that would be kind of a stressful thing to run into, especially in the dark, because all of a sudden, like, you're driving into what feels like oncoming traffic, and it's really strange. Uh, so once you get the hang of that spot, I think it really does make traffic flow a lot better, especially at like five o'clock when everybody's merging onto Fort Riley Boulevard and, and, and two busy roads come together. Uh, it's effective, but uh, I've still seen some pretty interesting crashes, which I think are usually because people are either drunk or not from around here, uh, and then they run into stuff because the road is just so bizarre. Uh, if you're on autopilot, uh, that doesn't work right there. Autopilot is defeated by the divergent diamond. Yeah, that you're, you're doing weird things, but so you'll still see accidents there, I think, from that. But uh, overall, in terms of traffic flow, I think they work really well, and I like it. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. One other question. How about out in the county, thinking of uh, Beat Creek Road and Pillsbury mm -hmm. Crossing? Lots of speeding out there. Do you go out in the county, or is that another department? No, we do. So the Riley County Police Department is just that. It's a county police department. It's kind of an unusual animal as far as uh, organizations go, uh, especially in Kansas. Uh, in 1970s, uh, certain freebie, you could probably tell me what the date was and all that better than I could, but uh, there was a consolidation of the county sheriff's department and the city police department for Ogden, Manhattan, all, all the jurisdictions within Riley County. Uh, the thought process here is you can pay for two, three, four chief of police or sheriff types. You can have all the cars and all the equipment you need to outfit all the cops to do these things in their own little jurisdictions. Or we can pool the money, swallow our pride and say, one guy's in charge and here's all the equipment for all of us and we'll all just cover the county. Uh, and so I think it's a, a smart way to do business because it saves the community money instead of funding three or four different organizations of various size. You know, if, if you're at the one police department and I'm at another one, we're not sharing our car, you know what I mean? So if mine breaks down, I need another one. So now I need two cars and you need two cars. But if we work at the same place, maybe we need three cars instead of four cars. Uh, it's a cost saving measure. And it also provides you a lot more service because if you have a four man sheriff's department and a hundred per you know, person department in Manhattan, if you're out on Deep Creek Road and you need help and uh, there's only two officers working in the county that night and they're up north, well, you're going to wait a long, long time to get somebody down there. Uh, whereas right now, you pick up the phone and you have a much larger selection of cops to choose from. Uh, so we are the law enforcement for both city and county in Riley County and for parts of Manhattan that are in Pottawatomie County. Jurisdictions get a little weird here. Um, so as far as that goes, we do have officers who are assigned to work the county, north and south. Um, they're still members of the Riley County Police Department. They can work anywhere just like I can. I could go up uh, to Riley, Kansas and, and run traffic right now if I wanted to. I could go down to Pillsbury Crossing and yell at people for swimming, not that they would today. It's a nice day to do a lot of things outside, but I don't know about swimming. Uh, or I could go downtown and walk at Aggieville and enforce uh, 
minor possession. We're able to cover the whole thing, but we have some guys who exclusively work the county, uh, and that's where they, sh they go every day for their job. If they need help, they can call for backup from the city. We come up and help. Uh, and the idea is we have set people who get to know the area a little bit better. Um, a lot of folks who live further out in the county especially, uh, they don't want the, the city cop. It's, it's kind of entertaining uh, if, if you're the, the officer who doesn't know where things are up there or anything like that. They want to know an officer who, who is familiar with the area, knows who lives where, can actually help. Um, yeah, if there's cows out, I don't know who's they. I, 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 that's a cow. I don't know whose that is. Uh, but the guys who work up there, they do know whose that is because they know who owns that section of ground and who to call and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, yes, we do have officers who exclusively work north or south county. They can be supplemented by others. South County gets a little less attention than, than North does just because of the volume of area. But yeah, that area is another one, uh, that Deep Creek Pillsbury area where you know, a lot of speed uh, and a lot of crashes from alcohol and things at certain times of year. But uh, we do have that pop up sometimes in this arc area, especially in the summertime where we will send officers down there to do extra enforcement because we know that the data says that's a high crash area in the summertime. Does that answer your question? Sir. Along with what you were saying earlier, uh, as, as far as the funding and such, it, it was a very big help for the North County and South County officers. It was, a, it was a big help to the county officers because they were outfitted with a lot more exclusive equipment than they ever thought they would ever have. Jaws of life in a car in the North County uh, because it may have to respond quicker to an accident, a major accident in that area. It's been a big help. Uh, and I was with the Sheriff's Department prior to consolidation and was dead set against it because I worked yeah. for the S Supreme Law Enforcement. Mm -hmm. But once it was in instrumental and in place, it worked so well. I'm surprised other agencies aren't doing it more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it makes such good sense. I think if we could all get our egos out of the way of I'm in charge, you're in charge, that we could, you know, we could get a lot more done. Yes, ma'am. Whenever you were discussing data into practice, about how long does it take for data to go into practice? So let's just say that one area, you know, new will be by the mall mm -hmm. because it's a high crash area. After about a month, you don't see any crashes. Does then other, your, you know, intelligence tell you, okay, so since there hasn't been any, are we going to move you somewhere else? So about how soon does practice and data kind of beat up? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, how often do we adjust our locations based on crash data? Uh, every couple of weeks, they adjust this and they'll send it out based on your shift. So if I work uh, an evening shift from say, uh, you know, uh, four in the afternoon until two-ish in the morning, something like that, uh, I'll get specific areas that my shift needs to be for that for that shift and they'll pop up on the screen and so every couple of weeks it's automatically changed up uh, and if there's something that spikes really fast there's a sudden issue and it's immediately noted then they can put it out sooner if an area goes dormant like nothing happens here and sometimes we do have that i won't call it a problem because it's not a problem our crime rates are really low uh compared to national averages um, and that's a good thing but it kind of makes the number crunchers bored sometimes because it's hard to say there's a trend when you don't have a lot of things to track like we had two is that a trend or is that just two things happened you know what i mean so sometimes we we have the issue of not having enough data and so sometimes we'll stay in an area a little longer because there's no data that says to change it uh, but yeah we do follow the numbers every couple of weeks at least once a month uh that changes up depending on those numbers so we, we try to stay on top of that sir I have a kind of unrelated question, but still driving safety. Road rage seems to be on an uptick. And I remember when I first started driving, road rage was obvious too, but it was a four letter word or an inappropriate hand signal. Now it's gone to people pulling guns, hitting cars, breaking windshields. What is the best way to handle a situation like that if you get involved in something like that? Yeah, uh, so the question is, what should we do with road rage uh, if, if you're involved in a situation where you're trying to get away from somebody? Uh, and again, this is just one guy's opinion, but uh, avoiding the confrontation is probably the biggest thing. If somebody's looking for a fight and you're not, don't give them the opportunity to have it, all right? We're mobile right now, we can, we can avoid it. Uh, there are rules against using your cell phone when you're driving, right? We all know that in Manhattan, we shouldn't talk on the phone when we drive. 
Uh, there are exceptions to that, like if there's an emergency, uh, use your phone. Uh, so number one is to call us as soon as you can. If you can safely use your phone while driving, call us ASAP, stay on the line. That's the big thing too, is uh, a lot of folks will call the police and say, I need help, and they'll say something and they'll hang up the phone. Stay on the line so that we can figure out where you are and update so that we can find you. Because if you tell us where you were two minutes ago or five minutes ago, it's gonna be really hard for me to find you because you're moving. So stay on the line, let us know where you are and keep us updated with what's happening and where you are. If you don't know the street names, that's fine. Don't crash your car trying to check. Just give us landmarks or generally the direction you're going or something and we'll, we'll catch up to you. Uh, describe the vehicle, describe the driver, describe everything you can to us so that if they drive off before we get there, we can still have a chance of finding them. Uh, go to a public place where you know that you're you know a lot of people cameras things like that you can drive to the police department you can drive to you know uh, the kind of box stores that have good cameras and things like that uh, with the idea being that if there's more people around hopefully somebody doesn't stop and uh, get out and you know try to fight you in front of 50 people that's not a very smart move from uh, you know self-preservation standpoint if you want to stay out of jail uh, if there's a weapon involved or something like that then yeah i mean you have a right to, we still have to drive with due regard, right? We still have to be reasonable. We're not gonna endanger other people, but there are some times when I think reasonably, if you need to speed to get away or do something like that, I'm not telling you to go blow the doors off of things or to drive unsafely, but uh, if you're worried about driving 60 miles an hour in a 55 in that sort of situation where somebody has a gun out, I'm not as worried about that as long as you're safe. Um, I guess the point being, avoid the confrontation however you can. If that means we pull over, if they pull over, you drive away, whatever, don't, don't have that conversation. Uh, don't, don't get out of the car, don't give them the opportunity to do those things. Uh, lock the doors, call the police, go somewhere public, uh, try to avoid the confrontation, that's the biggest thing. And sometimes they're unavoidable. I've seen instances where it's unavoidable, where people will follow anywhere and do anything. Um, lock the door, stay in the car, stay on the phone, yell for help, do whatever, but go to those public places and, and try to at least be on video and at least be where other people can find you. It's kind of a vague answer, I guess, because it's, there's so many variables involved in that. Because um, I know what you're saying, there, there is that uptick now of, it's like, uh, they don't pull over and threaten to fight you, it's somebody waves a gun at you through the window, uh, we, we do see that. Um, and that's, that's a really tough one to try to advise you on. I don't want you to pull over if he's got a gun, you know, and he wants you to stop, but it's, I, I can't tell you what the right move is in the right place other than to notify us and just stay the heck away from anybody who's that crazy. Don't hurt anybody else uh, in the attempt to do it, but it, we're reasonable people and the courts are reasonable. That's their, their mandate is to be reasonable. And uh, I, I'm not worried about speeds or things like that, I guess, in that moment, if you need to get away from somebody, as long as you're not endangering somebody else. Does that in any way answer your question? Yeah. Are there laws, so someone waves a gun at you or something to get a video, or is there a law against something like threatening you for Oh, arrest? absolutely, yeah. So aggravated assault, uh, that is uh, putting somebody in reasonable apprehension of great bodily harm. That's, that's the letter of the law, that's what it says. Uh, assault isn't hitting somebody in Kansas. In some states, that's what they call it. That's battery here. Assault is when I make you think that I'm going to do something dangerous to you. Uh, like a simple assault would be if I cock my fist back and, and act like I'm going to punch you in the face and you think that I'm actually going to hurt you. That's, that's a misdemeanor assault. An aggravated assault would be if I say pull a knife and threaten you with it or something like that. I don't have to touch you with it, but just the reasonable person seeing that and saying, I thought I was going to get stabbed or yeah, he whipped a gun out and waved it at me while I was driving as he was yelling. I thought he was going to shoot me. Yeah, that's, that's a violation. That's a felony. That's, uh, that's a big deal. And so that's why we do want to know, describe the person, uh, describe the car. Uh, and having a description of the person is really helpful too, whatever you can give us, because obviously a car can be driven by anybody. But it's really helpful if you describe a person who op you know, also happens to look exactly like the person who's a registered owner or driver of that car. Uh, so the more information you can give us, the better. But that is a serious felony offense, and we will take that and investigate that. Yeah, we do take that seriously. Yes, ma'am. So when you were talking about the ARC program and you, you guys go to different locations and things based upon data, so the obvious way you get data is based upon crashes or incidents or things like that occur. Do you use other resources for that data, like Facebook reports? Like, I mean, it's something, you know, because social media is a big thing now, people are always putting things on. Is there somebody doing that kind of 
reading some of those things that are stated and going off of that? Yeah, so the question is, do we do things other than just look at the numbers when we decide where to, to go for accident reduction? Uh, the answer is yes, we do other things. Uh, through our social media and some website options, you can uh, talk to us about things that are bugging you uh, on the website. Uh, and this QR code on here, by the way, that goes to our uh, community engagement page. If you do want an officer to come out for something and come talk to a group or come talk to you know, an organization or something, uh, that QR code takes you to the form. It's really easy to fill out now. It's all automated. You can do it on your phone. Uh, but it'll also take you to our website in general. And on there, there are in that same area of how to contact us, some places where you can contact us with a concern or a complaint or, or just something that's bugging you. And then our public information officer reviews all of those things and then assigns those out. So if you call in with a traffic concern, that will get read and then sent to our patrol division. And then the patrol commander will assign that out to a shift. Um, so if there's an area that we're getting complaints about, he can say, hey, uh, I want this squad to go out there and send somebody to that neighborhood at that time and go deal with that. But it's more so then it's really more the public's responsibility to kind of get it to you guys. You guys have somebody who goes to these other avenues at all? Well, so actually starting September, uh, we've initiated a new community engagement program that's based on uh, starting out with just Manhattan at the moment. It's kind of a pilot thing. We just started it. Uh, the city is divided up into areas and uh, we have a corporal assigned to each area. And so in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be rolling out some more stuff uh, publicly. And the goal being that if you are living, working or in an area of town, you know who your contact point is if you do have these kind of issues and you can start to build some kind of relationship. Like if memory serves, uh, Corporal Jason Hubbard is the southwest part uh, of town. Uh, he's the corporal assigned to this area. So uh, he's out of town right now. Otherwise, I would have brought him uh, with me to do this because I want him to meet you guys and start being a good point of contact for you. Uh, that's something we're going to roll out citywide here. Uh, it just started. And the goal being that you have a central point instead of uh, you know, always going and getting random people that you would at least have a, a common voice uh, uh, that you could speak to on those issues. But uh, the goal being ultimately to have some community-based meetings uh, in those areas with that corporal so that if you live in the northwest part of town or the southwest part of town, uh, we can publicize when we're having a community meeting for that area. You can show up, you can talk to that uh, corporal and some other members of the department who are there and you can express concerns or talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, and so that's, that's something we're phasing in as we go right now. We're, we're really trying to pump up our, uh, our engagement with, with you folks. That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm putting that QR code up there because if there is a group uh, that you think we should come talk to or if there is some kind of event that we can attend and, uh, and be available to you, we would like to do that. Um, so don't hesitate to contact us. We work for you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You know, yeah, my, and I and I think it does answer my question. I just wondered about like, because you know, like especially with younger people, they're not going to be so apt to contact you guys. Right. I mean, it's just that image thing. Mm -hmm. That's whatever. So that's why I'm wondering. You know, but they'll post something on a social media thing, or they'll say something, and it's like, how do you, you know, get that? Yeah, we have a public information officer who who keeps an eye on not just our own communications, but communications community-wide that might be relevant to us. Uh, you know, a lot of times they're aware of what's being said out there on the internet. Um, it's a lot of times limits on what we can say in response. We may know that this is bad data floating around, but you know, we're not gonna get involved in saying what is or what isn't. And, and you know, there's a lot of privacy issues that go into that. Uh, but they do stay on top of, of what's being said and, and they can address things that become community concerns before they, you know, get any bigger. Uh, and if there is some kind of common issue with traffic that everyone's talking about, uh, our, our public information officer will, will be aware of that and can send that up through our chain also. I had just read something just, I think it was either yesterday or the day before about there's this SUV that's in town that's trying to play chicken with people. Have you heard of that at all? I have not, no. Okay, I'm, yeah, I just wondered like how legit it is and like whatever. Yeah, I couldn't speak to that, and unfortunately, I spend most of my time, I reside at a desk now, and uh, I, I conduct training. Um, that's temporary, thankfully, but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm not cool. Uh, I, I sit, I sit in, a, in a desk most of the time now, so I'm, I'm not as plugged into some of this stuff as others might be, but I'm not aware of that particular issue. If you do see something like that, please call us, though. Uh, and again, as good a description as you can get, tag number, uh, driver description, all that good stuff. Uh, we would like to know about that, so. 
Yes, ma'am. So if you wanted to talk to someone about traffic around your area that you live in, we have two demos we're talking about. You say that again at the last part. Talk to the gentleman if you're talking about. Yeah. Why need to talk to the traffic police? Well, if you call the police department, and here's the other thing, anytime, if you have any kind of issue that's remotely police related and you're not sure who to call, just call our dispatch at the non-emergency number. Um, it's up there, that's 785-537-2112. Anytime, day or night, you can call that number if it's a non-emergency. And you can tell them, hey, I've got questions about traffic or I've got a concern about traffic. And they will hook you up with a police officer who will call you back or come out to your house, whichever you prefer. And they'll talk to you about any of those issues right then and then they can send it forward. What we're gonna do ultimately here is push out some more information about our area uh, corporals and their community engagement programs. And then ideally they'll have, you'll have a point of contact for just that area if you want to. But until that becomes more publicly uh, available to you, uh, don't hesitate to call us or to go to our website if, if that's preferable to you and you can use the uh, citizen concern uh, or comment section and you can write to us about it or you can just call us and, and tell us about it. Uh, and we're happy to hear from you. And again, anytime, day or night. If you wake up at two in the morning and you're bored and uh, it's bothering you right then, call us because chances are I'm out there at two in the morning and I'm bored too and I would love to hear from you. So. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, they'll do that. And you know, if that is an ongoing issue, uh, we would like to know if the street racing stuff's going on and it's bothering y'all, we want to know. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I guess a final question. Um, and you mentioned the street racing, but mm -hmm. you're talking to a bunch of car guys yeah. here, and sometimes we may be overzealous in our customization. Sure. Loud versus no uh, muffler at all, sure. maybe deep tinted windows, obscured vision with all the stuff hanging off the rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. Now, don't look at my convertible out there because <laughs> I've got fuzzy dice there. Absolutely. Yeah. What, are, I thought, what yeah. are the rules generally? that you look for and then, uh, you know, what are the, some of the problems? Yeah, uh, and so this is, again, Joe's opinion. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, uh, you know, your rights end where mine begin. Um, I, I frankly don't care if your car is noisy unless you're revving the engine at 10 o'clock at night outside my neighborhood, then I do care. Uh, if you're driving down I-70 and your car is loud, cool, I don't, I don't mind. It doesn't hurt anybody, you know. Um, I guess if that's what you're asking is how do we decide what we're going to do with that? Uh, I think it's an individual decision for most officers. Obviously we're, we're bound by the book. If it's a violation of the law and you do it, expect to get stopped. Okay. Now that being said, if I drive down the road at any given moment, just about every car I see is doing something wrong. Uh, that by that book, there's 200 and some odd violations in there. I'm pretty sure I can find something wrong with all of us. Uh, anytime we drive. You failed to signal 100 feet prior to turn. You made the uh, improper turn in the lane roadway. Uh, you know, your driver's side mirror isn't working. You have a crack in your windshield. It's not hard to find something. So we, we try to be reasonable about how we, how we utilize that. Um, one, you guys would be real tired of us real fast if we stopped for everything. And two, we wouldn't do anything else. Uh, when it comes to the street racing and things like that, my, my big thing is uh, the safety side of it. Uh, if your car is loud, awesome. Just don't rev the engine outside my neighborhood at two in the morning, because if you do that and I stop you, I'm after to write you a ticket. If you do it when you're going down 177, I'll say, well, that was loud, and I'll sit there and keep doing my paperwork. Um, that's my thing, is be respectful of others. You know, some of the car racing stuff, uh, we'll have people blocking highways at night so that they can go race. Like, I have zero patience, zero tolerance for that, because that's how somebody gets hurt or killed. Um, and it's probably not the person breaking the law. It's probably some innocent person driving who's going to get hurt or killed. And I have, I have no patience or tolerance for that. Uh, so I will enforce that. And I'll enforce that as uh, strictly as I possibly can because it hurts other people. Again, your, your rights end where mine begin. Uh, we, we share the road. We share this community. Uh, and so I'll be as reasonable as I can be with, uh, with most things because it doesn't hurt anybody and it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, and on those things that are safety violations, I, uh, that's, that's my standard personally for when I write a ticket as opposed to a warning. I'll warn for just about anything. I like to write warnings because they don't hurt anybody and it gives us a chance to talk. Uh, if you do something dangerous that could cause a crash, that's when I write a ticket. That's my personal standard. If what you did could cause a crash or hurt somebody else, I'll write you a ticket. And then I don't feel bad about it. And I think that we don't either, you know, as community members. Does that answer your question? All right. Anything else? Yes, sir. This is an allocation of resources question. 
whenever there's an incident, a crash, or whatever, you tend to see a lot of officers on the scene. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody, or the question is, who's in charge of allocating resources? Is it the first officer on the scene? Is it the dispatcher? Is there a commander somewhere that says, we got enough people at that scene, you guys take care of the other? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how do we allocate resources when we're going to a crash? Because I'm sure you've seen those where you show up and it's like, there's two cars crashed and there's like eight police cars. Like, why do you need that many people? A uh, couple reasons for that. It depends on how it comes out. So if we get a call that indicates there's an injury crash or something significant like that or major road blockage, they'll automatically send more than one officer. Because the idea is we want to get there and help you, but just as much our first job when we show up at a crash scene is to protect the crash scene so that we don't have more. Um, if I have a bunch of vehicles disabled in the road and I stop on the side of the road and jump out to come help you and I don't block the roadway, then chances are the kid on his cell phone that's got his head in the clouds that we talked about earlier plows into the back of that crash and now it gets worse and it gets worse. So you'll need officers there to block the intersections and to block the roads to prevent it from getting any bigger. And then we have to talk to the people involved and if they're injured, sometimes we end up rendering aid and doing things like that until EMS gets there. Uh, and then we have all the witnesses we need to talk to and people don't like to stick around because most of us have a place to be when we're driving. We're not just driving for fun, we're driving to go somewhere. And so that's one place where uh, it's really hard to get witnesses to stay put and I don't blame them because their chances are you were in your car to be somewhere and you don't want to be late to that thing. So a lot of times we'll have additional officers that show up because we want to try to as quickly as possible talk to everybody who saw something or was involved in some way. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, I appreciate y'all's patience, and uh, I'm apt to ramble. So thanks for being uh, being here and listening to me. So.